Welcome, friends, to this uh, afternoon session of our monthly meeting. Uh, this is the time for questions and answers. I hope uh, Jonathan, there is a hiding again. He has no there is. He is visible now. He has some questions. He will read the question, give it, pass on to me, and I'll try to answer those questions. All my life I've prayed and talked to God. What is the difference in praying and meditating? All my life I have prayed and talked to God. Well, what's the difference between praying and meditating? If you pray to God and ask for nothing, it's meditation. <laughs> if you pray to God and ask for something, it's a business transaction. <laughs> So a prayer to become meditation must be a prayer without asking for anything, just offering yourself to the Lord. And that way, if you pray, the most effective prayer would be if you pray within yourself, which means you should pray after establishing yourself in the third eye center behind the eyes. That's the best place for prayer. But if you pray with the body outside, your mind is only associating it with the physical things outside. If you want something more than what is physical and outside, then the best place to pray is at the third eye center, behind the eyes. Please, ex please explain Jesus dying on the cross for our sins. How do we go from Christianity to freeing ourselves to the beliefs that are true? Please explain Jesus dying on the cross for our sins. How do we go from Christianity to seeing ourselves to the beliefs that are true? Christ gave a message. Jesus Christ gave the same message in the language of his time. And the emphasis was that the kingdom of God is within you. The living God resides in this physical body and that you have to go within to find the truth. It's the same message all mystics are given throughout history. There was nothing new or different that he gave. His own gospel, his, uh, his disciples, apostles' gospels amplify his message even further. John says in the opening verses of his gospel, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. It's a reference to the same self, that's creative power, which has been called Word by Jesus, has been called Shabd by other mystics, has been called Nard, has been called Kalame Asmani. It's been called by so many names. And all the names are referring to the same power, the same power that creates everything and it can be found in this body, linking all levels of consciousness to the physical level. And from the physical level, we can go within and link ourselves with that word, with that power that created everything. And that can be heard in the physical body. Therefore, we call it the audible life stream, the audible shabd, the audible word, the word that can be heard at the stage within yourself. It's not a word that can be written or can be spoken. It's a word that can be listened to and, put, uh, and can be put, can we can put our attention on it. Jesus' teachings are no different at all. If you are believing in Jesus Christ, follow what he says. That he died on the cross, Yes, he, that was symbolic. There is a mystic in Sweden named Swedenborg who discusses the passion that Jesus wanted to create so that his message can go around. That he was put on the cross, made that message last for centuries and is still lasting today. Just because he put on the cross does not mean that the cross <coughs> attains significance. Somebody said to me a picture yesterday, that if Jesus had been put on an electric chair in modern times, we wouldn't have put on the cross. If people were against, they might have put him in an electric chair. 
we Christians would all be wearing electric chairs, pictures in our heart, on our throat, on our chest. Cross became a symbol because of that historical event. So that is why it is not that we have to go after the Jesus being hung on the cross. He was. Uh, he gave us the passion. It's one of the four passions that he delivered. This was one of them, which makes us remember even today. Many masters have done that, that they have put on a historic image of something, sometimes sacrificing themselves in the physical body, knowing it is temporary, and left a long-lasting message for us. Therefore, to shift from just a belief in Christianity or in, Christ, or in Jesus Christ, to shift to following what he's saying, to go within, can be done through meditation. Through meditation, you have the immense advantage of seeing creation from a different point of view. In that point of view, you can see the past. It will be very interesting if you have a look at the past. You have to go up to the second level of consciousness, that means the mental level, the causal plane. The causal plane will reveal to you that time is not moving, time is static, that events have been placed upon time. What happened 2000 years ago is still there, 2000 years ago. What happens a million miles away from here is still there, it's a million miles away. Time and space are the same thing. They just ordinates on the same continuum. Therefore, if you are at the causal plane, you can go back and see Jesus Christ as he was as a human being, working on this planet. And you'll be very shocked how we have twisted and changed all his teachings, how we have reduced his basic fundamental teaching of going within to find the truth into rituals and ceremonies that we perform outside today in the name of Christ. One of our great master disciple, his name was Shadi. He was a Muslim member of a gang of robbers, thieves. And he wanted to, uh, his gang wanted to rob the gold that was being collected in the Dera because they were going to make a, a, a auditorium, a satsangar, an auditorium where masters would give discourses. And they wanted to make it very look very pretty and put some gold pinnacles on top, little towers. And so people collected all their gold and donated to the Dera for that building. And this gang came to know there's a lot of collection of gold in that little town, little village, and we should easily go and rob that gold. They sent this guy, Shadi, to the Dera to do a reconnaissance, do a recce of where the gold was. So we'd one day just pounce upon that place with guns and steal it. When Shadi came, he came alone parked his truck at a distance and walked over to the Dera and came at a time when the great master was giving a discourse. So he went about the whole Dera, which is not very big, there were just a few homes, but 20 homes were there at that time. He went to the first house and saw some women sitting there. He said, isn't the master giving a satsang today? Yes, yes, he is giving satsang. Why didn't you go? The women said, we are protecting the gold. Where is the gold? In that box there. He said, this was really easy reconnaissance. He went to another home and some kids were playing there. He said, kids, why didn't you go to Salsa? We are protecting the gold. Where's the gold? We left some in the basket and some are hanging. He quickly discovered where all the gold was. He said, this will be an easy robbery. But then it occurred to him, what kind of man is giving a talk that these people don't care for the gold and leave it in the hands of these children, hands of these women who are gossiping around, not even caring? What kind of man would give a discourse like that, that they don't care for all this wealth? Let me go and see. 
So the discourse was going on. There were about 20 people in front of the great master. And this guy comes there and stands at the back. As it happened, at that moment, great master was talking of the power of the word, of the Shabd, that how it rings inside us, beckoning us, calling us for a true home. So he, when Shadi appeared in front, he happened to say, that Shabd, that sound current, that power rings in everybody, including thieves, robbers and decoits. He said, he's seen me and he knows me. How could this man uh, find out that I am a gangster? So that attracted his attention and he did not leave. He waited to talk to this man, the great master. When the discourse was o over, he ran up to the great master and he said, Master, how did you know that I am a gangster and a thief? Great master said, I don't know anything about you. I haven't seen you before. No, you recognize me. You are looking at me. I remember you looking at me and telling me that that shoved rings inside thieves and robbers and gangsters also. So you knew me. Great master said, no. I say this thing every day in satsang. That is nothing, nothing new. I didn't point out to you. Shadi says, I don't believe you. It was too much of a coincidence that just when I come, you should say that. So I am going to wait and find out what is this you are saying that rings true in me. To cut a long story short, great master accepted him. He said, you have to do some work here, not theft and robbery. Do you know any anything, any vocation, any job that you trained in? Shadi said, no, I only know how to rob. I am part of a gang since my childhood. I have grown up as a gangster, so I have no idea what else I can do. And great master said, well, even for robbery, you must have learned some talent. He said, oh, yes. In our gang, I am the guy who can repair a truck. I am the guy who can rewind a dynamo and armature if it breaks down. Great master said, there's a job for you. There's no electric power in this era. And now you can set up a dynamo and provide electric power. So you can work on it. We'll give you the money and the resources. So Shadi set up the first electric generator, which was run by a, a mobile en engine, and there was a leather belt that used to go around. To start that, we used to pull on the leather belt. And I'm reminded of it. I can see the picture of it because I pulled that many times with Shadi to start the engine, and then the bulb would light up. And the first bulb in Great Master's house was installed from the generator. This guy became Great Master's bodyguard, became his closest friend, became a very strong disciple and a great meditator. All his passion and energy which was going into stealing, into robbery, into that, turned into the spiritual path. And he was able to have several experiences. And normally Great Master would say, don't share your experiences because you might lose them because of too much ego coming in. Oh, I have that experience, you don't. So that's kind of ego. So he used to suggest, don't share about your inner experiences, unless you have so many experiences that they're surplus, they flow over, then you can share. He would liken it to a cup in which grace is being poured like water. A few drops go, go in, he says, I want to share. And no, nobody gets those drops and you lose them. But when the cup is full, overflowing, then you can share. His cup was overflowing and he shared several experiences. One of the experiences was he went back in time and met Jesus Christ and saw him giving a discourse just there. So all I'm saying is it was not unique for Shadi to do this. Any one of you can do it. Any one of you who has questions about what happened in the past and that curiosity is killing you. Uh, Sometimes people are very curious. If that curiosity is there, you can go back in time and see what happened. All the events that have been created for the physical universe are already placed on a linear time. Time, and we, time is not flowing. We are time traveling on the event to event, event to event, moment by moment. We are traveling on it and going through predetermined events that are placed on the timeline. So that is why it's possible at the causal plane to go back, back and forth, 
you can see the whole of the future and whole of the past. A friend of mine asked me the other day, after listening to this explanation of mine about time, he said, if I go in and I see the future and I see the ticket number of the lottery that's going to be drawn, can I remember and come back and win the lottery? I said, no, you can't. Why not? Because the moment you come down, that experience will fade away. Like the experience in dreams. People have seen lottery tickets in the dream and they wake up, they can't remember what the number was. So what he tried, actually tried, was to remember the number of a lottery to be drawn next day. And he saw the number and he saw somebody else winning. He said, how come I know the number, how can somebody win? So he came back and he tried to get that punched in lottery, whatever number you could select. And he selected the numbers, only two were right, the rest were wrong. Because they faded out so quickly. This is a designed thing that we don't remember. If we remembered, why would we be here? What would, it, would be the purpose of having a spiritual journey of awakening? awakening? We would be there already. We are there already. Our awareness has come down here. And this limited awareness confines us to this awareness. And that is why we, we do not remember. We, all of us have the capacity to go to the higher planes of consciousness by just withdrawing attention within ourselves. The more you can withdraw your attention within yourself, the further you will go. It is more and more within your own self, your own consciousness, that you discover the greater awareness of consciousness. It's not on the surface, it's not peripheral knowledge. It's going deep into your own self to discover and awaken to those levels. So, Jesus Christ, of course, he died on the cross. It's a great event by which the whole religion stands today. But it was just a message. The messages in his discourses, in the discourses he makes it very clear. So, uh, switching from the, uh, from the teaching on the cross to the truth is very simple. Just practice what he said. Go within and find the kingdom. When you come back, how do you know that you have come back and what you need to work on? When you come back, how do you know that you have come back? What do you need to work on? I went for lunch, I come back. <laughs> I know I'm back. I, I, there are some things which you know in a very strange way. One of them is the awareness of being awake. When you go to sleep and you are not aware of your body, that's what happens in sleep, that you are somewhere else or nowhere or you don't remember anything, but you are not in the physical body that is sleeping. When you come back to the wakeful state, how do you know you are awake? Do you try to call for a proof? When you wake up in the morning, do you say, I am not sure if I am awake. I am going to pinch myself. I am going to call people to tell me if I am awake or not. You don't do that. Supposing you wake up in the morning and there are 20 people saying you are still sleeping, will you believe them or believe your own experience of wakefulness? You believe that you are awake because you know you are awake. The same thing is happens in higher wakefulness. When you come to the higher stage, you awake to a higher level. But the real secret, why you know you are awake is that you remember that you went to sleep. Supposing we forget that we went to sleep, you will never know if you are awake or not. The moment we are awake, we reattach ourselves to the experience before we went to sleep. You don't have to open your eyes. When we are awake, our body is still lying in the bed, eyes are still closed, and we know we are awake. What has happened? The only thing that's happened is you remember you went to sleep in the same bed. It's a link between a level of consciousness from which you left to a lower level and came back and 
the awakening links you with the past experience, the memory kicks in and you know you are awake. It's identical to higher wakefulness. The higher wakefulness, you will know you are always there. When you reach your true home, you will laugh very boisterously. I thought I had gone somewhere, I was there all the time. I was just dreaming, series of dreams, dream within dreams, and creating new experiences, and I have woken up, but I was always here. Nobody who reaches such kind feels, I have come to a place. They feel they were always there, they have just woken up to where they actually were, where the whole show was created, where everything happened. Only we shut our eyes and created dream-like states, and then dreams within dream states, and then dreams within dream. We dreamt several times within dreams. I, I was advised to see a movie called Inception. I don't normally watch movies, but a friend of mine, who's a filmmaker, or is the business of filmmaking in India, he said, you should see the movie Inception. So I saw it. In that movie, people dream and create different experiences in different universes. Then they dream within the dream. And they can go out three times into dream within dream within dream. And what was most noticeable for me was two things. One, that when you go into dream sequence, the time frame changes. And ten minutes dream can give you an hour, hours of experience in the dream state. In the physical body, it will be only 10 minutes and you will have experience of an hour. If you go dream with a dream, the third one, you can live a life of 50 years, 100 years, when it's only an hour in the upper dream and 10 minutes in the physical dream. They bring that up very nicely in that movie, which is exactly what's happening. But we are in the sixth dream, so we create millions and trillions of stars and planets and put ourselves in infinite time by dreaming within dreaming, dream, whereas no time is passing at all in our true home, which where we belong. It's just a, it's a instantaneous, the whole thing is happening. But the other thing interesting in that movie was that these guys who practice this to create visions and dreams of their choice, they also carry a method of wakeful, of awaking. They carry a little totem in their hand. And that little totem with a little sharp edge so if you press it, the pain wakes you up, no matter how deep you are sleeping. So they use that totem, which goes into the dream sequence also, and there they can press that in the dream and they wake up. And I said, this is exactly what the spiritual path says, that we all have a totem to wake up. The totem is not a little pricky thing, it's a lovely form of a perfect living master who loves us unconditionally. But it's still a totem. Is still this, performing the same function of awakening us to our true wakeful state. So th this thing, uh, when you wake up, you know you are awake because you were there before that. That's the simple answer. That your memory comes back that you were there. That's your home. Yes, Charlton. What is your stance on climate change, and do you believe that polluting the earth creates bad karma? What is your stance on climate change? And do you believe that polluting the earth creates bad karma? Climate change, if we look back at history, two things happened. An ice age came, froze everything. And a warming up came, which melted the glaciers. It's our history. And both things have happened and both things will happen, no matter what. <laughs> this is not human intervention that is creating these things. It's the law of, of the weather itself, climate itself, that this happens. And the same thing will happen. The question really in the minds of scientists is not whether we are warming up or we are cooling down to an ice age, but what will happen first? So going by the trend, they think that the warming up will go first, creating all the, uh, all the glaciers and ice blocks up there in the mountains, melting and destroying everything in the flooding. And then the flooding will not have enough heat and will lead to an ice age. And then the planetary heats outside, the sun's heats and so on will bring us up there. It's a cycle. This cycle we have gone through before, 
same cycle will take place again. About karma, how do we create good and bad karma? We create karma, good or bad, with our intention to act. If our intention is good, then we create good karma. If our intention is bad, we create bad karma. And what determines good and bad? A little part of our mind reserved for advising us on good and bad. A moral conscience, and it's called conscience. We have a conscience in our head. How is it, how is it building up its database for good and bad? It's based upon the society around us, the people around us, the experiences of people in society around us, they lay down the rules. What is good, what is bad, and we are trained right from beginning to accept that and we fill that conscience of ours with ideas of good and bad and therefore we go through creating karma that is good and bad. If a person knows this is not good according to norms, moral laws, legal laws created outside of him and he follows them and he says I am being good, it will be good karma created. He will be kind to people, moral code says that. He will follow the law, he will not go into red lights with his car, he will create good karma. If he does opposite of what the social data is, inside his conscience, he will create bad karma. This good and bad karma is very good actually. That to have good and bad karma is a secret of having a human life. If this was not there, Supposing there was no karma at all, we could not be here as human beings. The designing of human life was made on the basis of a mixed good and bad karma. If human beings in particular life had only good karma, they would be another part of creation, which we call the heavens. There are plenty of heavens to populate all the good people in the astral plane. If all our karma was bad, we would be in another place called hell, also in the astral plane. There are places where we can spend time, both in pleasure or pain, depending upon good or bad karma. Only when we have a combination of these two that we come to the human form. That is why it's good to have high and low to be able to come here. And what's the advantage? of coming here. The advantage is that you have the experience of free will, which you neither have in heaven nor in hell. The experience of free will, that means ignorance of the future, which is bliss. Ignorance is bliss in this case, that we don't know the future, we think we are making decisions, choice making is predetermined, but we can't see it is predetermined. Therefore, we get the experience of being seekers. That experience of being seekers is what leads us to the ultimate awakened, awakened state. That is why it's very important to have that experience of free will to become a seeker and by becoming a seeker find the ultimate truth and awaken to the highest level. Karma is created so that the, our presence here can be continue, continued. You do good karma, you have to be rewarded. You do bad karma, you have to be punished and punished in the same place where you did good or bad or some peripheral area around that. What are the peripheral areas? Peripheral areas are the dream state. You might have committed a bad crime, but in this you have got some divine intervention. You pay off your karma, the bad karma, the, re the reaction to the bad karma in your dream state. Or it can be astral plane. So you go through your karma, but most of it is in the physical plane. So that is why we get rewarded or punished depending upon the karma we created with our good or bad intention based upon what is affecting us from outside. So therefore, we cannot lay down a single rule for everybody because not all the people think alike. What could be something bad in the society here could be good in another society. What could be bad here today could be good one time. What could be bad then is good now. These things keep on changing. So the triggers for karma, good or bad, keep on changing. 
but we create it according to what is prevalent at that time and that is how we come back again and again and this is a trick also the karma is also a trap and a trick to keep us here you can do all the good things in the world help everybody be very generous do lot of worship and prayer prayer to get things of this world mostly but you can also do good to people and get very good karma and spend time in heavens and then come back again after it's over it doesn't get you out the karma is something that's holding us back here and at the same time it's giving us the opportunity to escape from here by giving a human life so it's a very tight kind of uh, system that's been created and it is not easy to understand karma there is a song which the followers of krishna lord krishna who was considered to be an incarnation of vishnu one of the gods of sustenance who was considered to be a god figure in human form long long time ago as a historical figure we consider he was a little boy who was born like a little ordinary person but was very clever as a small child and he was like anybody else as like children he told lies he played played with other kids like other kids he was very fond of butter and he would come and steal the butter he was getting fat um, there was no other was general obesity in those days but krishna was an exception so his mother tried to hide the butter she used to keep the butter in a little um, basket type of pan and put it and hang it high up so he couldn't reach there but he would bring all the boys and they would climb one on top of each other he would go steal the butter eat it as much as he can and run away there is a story of how he ate that butter and came and the butter was all on his face and tried to eat quickly and his mother said are you again eating butter and he says no mama i eat no butter at all and this particular statement i am making is made into a song a devotional song people sing that oh mother i did not eat any butter and the butter is all on my face and the mother laughs just because we like krishna and his teachings we like krishna he gave the best teachings on the battlefield to his boss prince arjun who chauffeur he was who was hired by arjun as a chauffeur to drive his chariot and between cousins a big war was going on and both the armies are on both sides by ready to fight and krishna turns to his boss and says arjun i want to tell you something fight with passion fight this he says i can see my own uncles i can see my own relatives how can i fight he says this fight has already taken place it's just a replay of the fight and he even opened his mouth wide and showed all of them dead and he performed miracles like that so krishna became very popular as a very enlightened person who enlightened so many people but as a child he had a childhood friend whose name was udo and udo and krishna were both cow herds they took care of the cows of the village they would just go in the fields while they were grazing the cows they were playing tricks and krishna played more tricks than udo he teased the girls a lot and who were called gopis they loved him because of his extraordinary powers his extraordinary attractive face and he played the flute the music very beautifully but he teased them then it is recorded in devotional way how he used to hide their clothes when they were taking a bath in the pond and he wouldn't bring the clothes back things like that a naughty guy you have to accept that yet he tells even as a child he tells his friend udo they are both out in the fields the cows are crazy he says udo karma is a very difficult thing to say karma ki gat nyari se it is very difficult to explain what karma is people just take it like doing good or bad things no now watch and he points to an ant crawling on the ground he says udo look at this little ant such a small little insect crawling this ant has been once brahma the creator of this universe 
has once in a previous life been in the head of one of the heavens. Today, because of karma, in spite of those experiences, into infinite time, he is back as an ant. Karma is no easy thing to explain. Karma cannot be atoned. You do bad thing, you say, I'll now do good things all my life to make up for it, you'll be punished for the bad and rewarded for the good. Karma is such a relentless thing. And karma is what's creating the biggest trap for us and keeping us here. So that is why we should understand this karma is not a very simple thing. It's the basis of our creation here, it's the basis of our human life here. It's the basis on which we are acting and reacting with people. It's the basis on which we are becoming seekers, getting out of here. So, whether climate change is a massive karma or not, it depends on how we are going to handle climate change. I suggest to the people who can handle it, do it with a good intention and create some good karma and have a little trip to heaven. Do you have any tips on dealing with anxiety or dealing with a wandering mind? Do you have any tips on dealing with anxiety or dealing with a wandering mind? Let's, let me talk about anxiety first. What makes one anxious? It is living in the future. It is thinking of the future. If you think of the future, which you don't know, you are anxious. If you don't think of the future, you won't be anxious. Great remedy, best remedy. And what is a wandering mind? Living in the past, remembering old things, feeling guilt for what you did. You carry guilt. Mind wanders back into all those events and you feel totally helpless and depressed. This depression, anxiety, and all that can go away if you do not live in the future or the past, but live in the now, in the present. People have recommended, I, I saw a book presented to me, uh, Power of Now. It says you should live in the now. You should only concentrate on what is ahead of you. Of course, uh, it did, I did have a little chuckle on that statement, you should live in the now. I wanted to meet somebody who doesn't live in the now. I haven't met any. We all live in the now. We can't live anywhere else. But when we say we live in the now, we should live in the now, we are talking of our mind not occupying places in the past or the future. That we shouldn't be thinking about the past and the future. And that's what causes anxiety and depressions and wandering minds. If we live in the now, you have a task to do, do it. You have something to go through, go through it. And never bother about what happens. Again, bringing Krishna's teaching, Krishna told Udo, and he also told Arjun in the chariot, that if we perform our duty based upon the karma which has brought us to the point of performing our duty, that means our karma, our own actions, have brought something to us. To deal with it, we have to do our duty. We have a child born to us because of our karma. We bring up the child is our duty. He distinguishes between the two as karma and dharma, dharma being our duty. He says dharma should be fulfilled without bothering about what the effect result will be, what the fruits thereof. You must do your action to the best of your skill. He says, yoga, karma, su, kaushalam. True yogi, if you want to be a true yogi, you should perform your actions with the utmost skill and then not think of the fruits thereof at all. If you can do that, there will be no anxiety and there will be no wandering mind. Therefore, if we can live on this basis, that what is in front of us? It has all come because of karma. And we deal with it to the best of our ability, physical, mental, spiritual ability. We deal with it, that's our dharma. You will be very confident and become fearless. And you will be a good then candidate for spiritual success in meditation, if you can do that. Therefore, it's good to remember that to live in the now means to deal with the present. Of course, I sometimes wonder if people can see the easy flaw 
in the fact that we don't know what now is, that we think now is a time. We are sitting, I'm talking in the now. That's not true. Before I utter a word, it's past. It's a future. After I utter, it's past. Where is now? There is no now, really. Now is supposed to be a meeting point between the past and the future. Past has gone. Future is still to come. Then where are we living? What time frame are we living in? We are living in a timeless now. It's not even a billionth part of a nanosecond. Now has no dimension at all. Yet, we all live in that now. Have you ever realized we're not living in time at all? Even now as physical beings? What are we living in then? I am talking to you, saying words in the now. Truthfully, I am saying them in the past. Recent past we are calling now. Otherwise, now has no time. What is the past? Past is memory. Supposing you had no memory, there would be no past. You can't remember even one millisecond what happened ago if you don't have memory. So memory brings and creates a past. Time taken to create a present is a function of memory. I'm going a little more metaphysical. You'll excuse me if I'm going a little higher, too fast. The memory creates the experience of the present. That means past is creating our present. There is no present at all. Then what is future? How is future being created? Future is being created by our own action of the past and using function of the mind called hope, fear and anticipation. These are all three words. They just mean the same thing, anticipation, neutral thinking about what is going to happen. Hope is positive, fear is negative. If we don't think these things, we don't have any future at all in our life. We wouldn't be knowing what future is. You eliminate these three words from the dictionaries, there is no future. Future is being created by the past. Present is being created by the past. Past is past, so everything is past. How can you experience past? If you are not in the past, but you are in the now, you can only experience by memory. If you now study life from this point of view, it's only a memory, a recall of something already happened somewhere else, not here, that we are going through. That's a good psychological and scientific explanation of predetermination that you cannot have. Just examine the nature of time. And you cannot have this experience except through memory and a replay through memory. That's exactly what's happening. But it's so vivid, it's so vivid that the sensory experiences of the memory are making it a reality and we are putting memory as something that is not so real as what we are experiencing through sense perceptions. So that is why, although we say we should live in the now, it, what it really means is, don't spend your time thinking, ruminating over what happened in the past. Past is past. It's over. And there are some principles of Hindu philosophy which says, the first principle is, you don't meet anybody in this life without a purpose. It's, it may be, you give advice, they give advice, their interaction, something is being settled. Otherwise you won't meet anybody. Second principle is, and nothing will happen before or after except it's destined to happen. You can't pull the time of an event earlier, nor push it later. It'll happen at the right time. Third principle is, what is over is over. What's happened has happened. You can't do anything with it. So don't even try. That's the secret of getting over your anxiety and wanting mind stick to what is in front and stay with it. Of course, if you watch all this show, from third eye center, inside, all this will be very easy and natural to do, to live in the now. What is your stance on LGBT lifestyle? What are these words? Do you know the meaning? Lesbian, gay, bisexual, transsexual, or transgender. Lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, transgender, 
And what about the rest? <laughs> I thought there were many more. Anyway, uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender. Transgender. Okay. Let me first say a little thing about gender. Our soul, our atma, has no gender. It never had gender, never will. The power of consciousness that generates, gender generates everything, has no gender at all. It's not male, female, or mid, in, in between somewhere. No, it's none of these. It's pure consciousness. Only when it enters from its true home into individuation and par Brahm and then enters to Brahm, the creator of this universe, enter the causal plane of the mind. It splits and divides. In fact, it splits, having become one unit from totality, it has become one drop from an ocean. The drop that divides into two parts, not exactly equal parts, but divides into two parts, which creates gender, then the gender keeps on working throughout our life here. The, the gender is not in the soul. The gender is in the mind. But when the mind begins to function in other forms of life, like physical forms, including all other life forms besides human forms, it splits into the gender. Some becoming male, some becoming female, but when you have a body through which you go through a karma, supposing your gender is male, you are a male sex person, and you are looking at the women getting the better deal, you say, I wish I was a woman. A strong wish occurs to you, I wish I was a woman. That one wish can lead you to the next life of being a woman. A woman with a male gender in it. A woman with a male mind in it. A woman who thinks like a mind, functions like a mind, but the body is female because of the special wish that was expressed and is being fulfilled in the next life. That woman will act like a man. And whereas we will think there's a gay couple come across, actually they're not gay. They're gay in their bodies, but in their minds they're different. And that's what's creating this. Now supposing the male mind gone into female body and gets ridiculed and says, where have I landed? This is not the right place. I should be a man, not knowing that the gender already is a man, and comes back in the next life as a male. Male mind, a male body but you think like a woman because of one life who had as a woman. The, then the combination and permutation start. All these that we're talking about are all variations based upon these experiences which generate our future lives. That is why we, I, I remember at one time I used to do some palm reading to raise funds for travel to this country. And a woman comes to me, sitting across, showing her and She's a full-blown woman, you don't understand. <laughs> and I am looking at the hand and I say, these are the hands of the man. And she says, I am a man. That I know I am a man. That was experience I had at, uh, very early on when I came here. Another woman who has a male gender in her, with the dream, she looks into the mirror, she sees a man, not a woman even in the dreams. So these different variations have taken place, but perfect living masters are not concerned with any of this stuff. They have not come to take our body somewhere, to take our mind somewhere else, to take our sense perception somewhere, take astral self somewhere. They come for the soul, and the soul has no gender. They do not make any distinction whatsoever based on gender. That is why they love each one, no matter what their lifestyle is, no matter what their preferences are. So my stance is the same stance that my master had, great master, Rul Maharaj Baba Savan Singh, that love is for everybody. There's no exception at all. 
that the spiritual teachings are for all equal and we treat everybody equally, no matter what their lifestyle. It is said that upon initiation, the master takes full control of disciples' destiny or karma. If an initiated disciple commits a suicide, is it because he was destined to commit suicide? And if so, why was he chosen by the master for initiation? It is said that upon initiation, the master takes full control of disciples' destiny or karma. If an initiated disciple commits suicide, is it because he has he was destined to commit suicide? And if so, why was he chosen by the master for initiation? I want to make it very clear here. Initiation has nothing to do with your body, with your mind, with your karma. Nothing to do with it. Initiation is for a soul seeking to go back home. Period. If Master began to judge us based upon our karma, and none of us will get initiated, I can tell you this. Look at our own lives. Do we have any chance? They do. They overlook everything. They are not looking at the body, they are not looking at our sens sensory system, they are not looking at our mind, they are not looking at our sins, they are not looking at our karma, they are looking straight at the seeking of the soul, wanting to go back home. And that soul very often has gone through all different types of karma, including the karma of suicide, including the karma of murder, including the karma of all kinds, high and low. Masters, when they initiate a person, they look at the soul of the person and say, this soul is ready to go home. And therefore, they accept them and take them back home. So, there is no association with karma at all. They are not judging us. That's one of the beautiful things about masters. Perfect living masters have no judgment whatsoever. They'll never judge us. Their love for us is totally unconditional. It's not based upon any judgment or evaluation based upon how good we are, how bad we are, whether we are doing good things, whether we are doing bad things. They know all this is a trap. They know the whole destiny is a trap. They know the whole process of birth and rebirth and karma is a trap for us. They are trying to take us out of the trap, not become part of the trap by judging and by saying whether I should take him or not based on judgment. They have no judgment at all. They only have love and compassion for us because they are contacted with our soul. Last but not the least. For the eighth sense, how many Shakey's pizzas must one consume before achieving enlightenment? <laughs> I was thinking of cracking a joke myself. <laughs> Thank you very much, questioner. For the eighth sense, for those who have not heard about the eight senses, I might repeat them again. That there are five senses of perception and motor senses, senses of action. So those five senses, all human beings have. Then there's a sixth sense called intuition, a greater gut feeling. They say women have more of it. I, I suppose they have. Otherwise, how would they beat all the men around? But anyway, the sixth sense in, is intuition. And those who have that are much higher in their awareness than those who are only living by five senses. Then there's a seventh sense. The seventh sense is called common sense. It is very uncommon. It's, it's still called common sense. What is the seventh sense? The seventh sense is the ability to recognize what is important, what is un unimportant. It helps you to prioritize your life. And it is separation of the chaff from the grain that you are able to do because of common sense. So common sense is rare, but it's a very good thing. It puts your priorities right. If you have common sense, you'll put meditation number one. You'll put spiritual path number one in your life. When you have less common sense, then we put it down below somewhere. That one day we will, when we get time, we'll meditate. No, meditation should be number one. And the eighth sense is the sense of humor. <laughs> the ability to laugh. The ability to laugh is a much deeper sense than we realize. 
the ability to laugh will come automatically to you if you look upon this universe as a movie. The moment you look upon this whole universe, created universe, in its true color, you will laugh immensely. You will say, how could I take these things so seriously? What has happened to me that I couldn't see? That this is what the universe is, a big game going on, an entertaining game, interesting game, and make you laugh in your spirits, and sometimes makes you laugh on your face also. So I'm very happy that we're ending with this wonderful, uh, nice message that laughter is the best medicine, and laughter is also useful in meditation, when you meditate inside. Share that space with your master. I really want to spend time with you people who are seekers and share my experience with you. How meditation improves, thousand percent meditation improves if it is not merely done as a, as a monotonous way of closing eyes and sitting and trying to repeat words and try to listen to a sound which is not audible at all. And strange kind of other sounds can be heard. Instead of converting that into a meditation, you sit with your master, your beloved, and express your love to the beloved, and share your jokes, and share your humor with your master inside, and fly together to higher planes. That is good meditation, an enjoyable one. I hope you'll get part of that. Thank you.